All right, I'm going to get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming to my session, Inclusive Design, Thinking Beyond Accessibility. Uh, I'm really happy to be here at New Jersey Camp. I was just telling some folk that I, I drove up from Boston last night, so it was a fun five and a half hour drive. I, uh, instead of doing playlists or you know Spotify or um, podcasts, I went to my basement and I pulled out my old book of CDs, and I listened to albums the whole way through, and it was awesome. It was a good musical journey. So, um, thank you for coming to my session, I appreciate it. Uh, my name, I'm Mike Miles, and I'm from, as I just said, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I've been working with Drupal for almost a decade now. Uh, I do a lot, I've built modules, I maintain websites. Um, I'm the lead organizer for the Boston Drupal Meetup, and one of the organizers for the New England Drupal Camp, so towards the end of the year, if you want to come to New England, come to a really cool camp just like this one, highly recommend it. Um, and during the day, I am a technical solutions manager for a digital marketing agency, Genuine. So Genuine, we're a full service digital marketing agency. Uh, and what we do is we build agile brands that say culturally relevant. So what this means is we make brands easier to love and, and increase their engagement. We do that by leveraging all the in-house services that we have. So we're not a Drupal shop. We do a lot of Drupal development, but we have a .NET team. We have a front end team who uses React and Node. We also have a whole video production team and UX and digital strategy. Just the gamut of anything that brands may need to do digitally, we can do. So for me, 99% of that is architecting Drupal websites or platforms and telling clients, this is not, I know what you want, but this is what you need. And uh, that could be a hard conversation. In the evening, I am the host of the Developing Up podcast, which is focused on the non-technical side of being a developer. What that means is I don't talk about code with people. We talk about how to set professional goals or how to work in a team and give feedback or how to ask for help, topics like that. So uh, I recommend giving a listen. And if you want to know any more about me, anywhere on the internet, I'm Mike Miles 86 on Twitter, on D.O., on LinkedIn, on Google Plus, if anybody uses that. I don't think I do, but I secured the username. So I want to start out by making a statement about the one thing I think we all have in common. And no, it's not our love for Drupal, but it's that everyone in this room, every day we want to make a positive impact on as many people as possible. How many people here would agree with that statement? All right, all the hands, it's great. Um, right, we're developers, we're UX designers, we're designers, we're content editors, we're maybe project managers, and every day we're working on building something that is going to improve the live lives of some people somewhere, whether it's for our clients, it's for their users, it's to just make some positive impact. And this is important because inclusive design, the definition of it is planning considerations to ensure that a product, service, or environment is as usable by everyone to the great extent possible. Basically, what we all just agreed we do every day is so we try to build things that are usable and make a positive impact. Now, inclusive design is not a new subject, just like accessibility is not a new subject. Uh, and it evolved from this concept of universal design, which was a term coined in the 1960s by Ronald L. Mace. He was an architect, uh, and he's the founder for universal design, the center for universal design. And what Ronald tried to do was, when building and planning architectural projects, was thinking about how usable could he make this space that he's designing. Could he, he make it not just for the people he was building it for, but for everyone who's going to use it. Um, and taking those different perspectives into his work and thinking of the differences people have and how he can incorporate that into what he did. And building on top of that was Sluan Goldsmith, who is another architect. He actually wrote the book Designing for the Disabled and he coined the term barrier-free design. And what Sluin did was look at public space, mainly public spaces, and figure out how to remove barriers. And I'm talking about physical barriers, columns, curbs, stairs. How could those be removed to make it so more people could enjoy those spaces that were built? And then uh, Patricia Moore, who's also one of the sort of like founders of Inclusive Design, it is famously known for dressing up as an elderly person and restricting her movement and experience in the world that way. So as an industrial designer, she would do this. She would write reports on the trouble she had and ways to improve areas. Now what's great about these and how this leads into what we do as developers is that they focused on improving areas for people with accessibility needs, 
But by doing so, they set this movement to make the world better for even more people. And I, I want to share an example of this, something that we all here benefit from because of, of what they led the charge on, and that's the sloped curb. So anytime you go to across the street uh, in America and most other countries, when you come to a crosswalk, the sidewalk slopes down to meet the street so you can cross it. Now this is part of ADA compliance. I, I apologize, the screen is very dark. Um, it's part of ADA compliance, so people in wheelchairs, people with walkers, people with crutches or canes, they can cross the street easily without a barrier. But universally, this improves the lives of everyone else. So parents with strollers can easily cross the street. Delivery people with hand trucks can easily move their goods. Distracted millennials or Generation Z people, um, if they're on their cell phones, they're not going to trip on the curb. They're able to cross the street. And this is what inclusive design is about. It's about thinking beyond accessibility. And it's true with our digital products that we build with Drupal or any other technology. Is that you know we take in consideration all these accessibility needs people's vision impairments, their hearing impairments, their cognitive ability, their mobility, ability to use a mouse or a keyboard. And these are great to build against, to plan for, the differences of. But humans are different in so many different ways. And that all these other ways impact how we experience the digital world and how things become more useful for us. So we're talking about things like different locations, different genders different languages, different education levels, people's age, all these impact how they interact with the products we build. You know, when we build products, we want to make a positive impact on as many people as possible, so we want to think about these differences that these people have and how we're making sure they can use what we're building. Now, inclusive design, when I was first learning about it, I came across the 10 principles of inclusive design by Sandy Wassmer, who's a UX developer out of the UK. And in 2010, she was asked by the UK government to collaborate and come up with 10 principles that they're going to use for all their digital properties. And this is what they came up with. I'm not going to go through them all. That would be a very exhaustive talk, and I don't think it would be beneficial for us at this time. But basically, they came up with these 10 ideas that every UK government website uses when they're building to make sure that it works for all their users, aka all their citizens. In 2010, they actually wrote these as part of their e-accessibility action plan. So now it's, it's mandated into law. So I took these 10 ideas and I, it made me think about what I do in my day to day and how we can improve what we do every day when we build things. And I came up with what I like to call my four pillars of inclusive design. These are four ideas I believe everyone in this room and for the future, everyone listening to this recording uh, can follow to make our products better and more inclusive. So the ideas are, one, no user is average. Every user deserves equal access. To provi provide understandable content for every user. And every user deserves our trust and respect. I'm going to throw a copyright on there, but it's Creative Commons 4.0. Yay, open source. So feel free to copy these. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to talk through these four pillars. I want to share why thinking this way helps us build better products. And it benefits not only us, but it benefits our clients, it benefits the users, it benefits the world, and allows us to make a positive impact on as many people possible every day. So no user is average. If we believe that no user is average, then we have to throw out this notion that we can assume who our users are, that we can just look at analytical data and make uh, an assumption that everyone falls into one bucket by, by just averaging all the results. We have to throw out that idea and recognize that our users are very different. No one is the same. They all have intricacies that we have to identify and allow, allow is not the right word, identify and um, uh, accommodate. So there's a great story about the problem of assuming the average user. Can everybody see this? This is really dark. Is there any? We don't have to control the lights, do we? Uh, yeah, all right. Um, I don't know. All right. If someone would happily be able to find the light controls, I'll look for it. Oh, there we go. Ooh, is that somewhat better? Yeah. All right. I'm sorry, now you're not going to be able to see your notes, but 
If it becomes a problem, we can turn the lights back on. All right, so a great story about the problem with assuming average users. In the 1950s, the US Air Force had these new jets. Wow, you can't see that image at all. Uh, OK. There's a picture of a jet up there. <laughs> <laughs> and the, I guess we can turn the lights on. It doesn't really matter. Oh. <laughs> now, now it's too much lights. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I have no idea. There's no controls up here for it. All right. Can we turn them off? Do you mind? Yeah. So you can see something. Okay. Mood lighting. All right, so they had these jets. There's a jet up there that were not performing well, fatally so sometimes, which is very tragic. So the Air Force figured it must be the pilots. Let's get a whole new batch of pilots in here and the planes will work better. Nope. Still have problems. All right, it's not the pilots. It must be the trainers. So get some new trainers in here, retrain the pilots. Still no improvement. It's not the trainers. It must be the training material. Let's rewrite the training material, retrain the trainers, train the pilots. Still no go. It took a while, but what they realized was the problem was the interface between the pilot and the airplane, the cockpit. Now the problem was uh, the Air Force has all this great measurement data on all their, their pilots. And so they took the average measurements of everybody, gave it to their contractors and said, build a cockpit that works for this average, quote, average pilot. The problem was that average pilot didn't exist. So the cockpit was built for literally nobody. So it wasn't until they went back to the drawing board and said, hey contractors, I need to build a cockpit that works for our shortest pilot and our tallest pilot. So let me ask everyone another question here. How many people here have ever driven in a car? Raise your hand. I can still see your hands, great. Uh, how many people here have ever adjusted the seat or the controls in a car? All right, everybody raise their hand again. You have this project to thank for that. They built adjustable controls, adjustable seating for this cockpit so that when a pilot got in, they could adjust it to meet their needs. It wasn't the average leg length. And then that got carried over into car design, and now we have adjustable seating in our car, so everybody benefited. Now this story came from a TED Talk called The Myth of Average by Todd Rose, who is a Harvard professor. And another interesting note, he's also a high school dropout. Um, and in his TED Talk, it's called The Myth of Average. It's a great TED Talk, look it up online. Um, Todd says, if you design for the average, you are literally designing for nobody. And it's true, as the Air Force found out in the 50s and as we need to recognize in our work today, that if we're building our digital applications for the average user, we're building our products for someone who doesn't exist. So we need to think beyond the averages, start learning about the differences that make up actual use base, our user base and plan so that our product can work for them. So how do we do this? I have some thoughts. This is not ex extensive, uh, but I just wanted to use as a guideline to help you start thinking about things. So we can create personas with limitations. How many people here have used personas? All right, good number of hands. Um, quick note, yeah, so when we turn the lights on, you can't see the projected image at all. Brightly. Yeah. Hey, you want to turn the lights on and you can see what happens? Yeah, yeah. See? I'll keep going while you're messing with it. Please do. So we create personas with limitations. So a persona is when you put a name and a face and a story to a fake person that everybody on your team builds against. Now. What we can do is just augment these personas by adding limitations to them from the get-go. Like, uh, there are women who has red, green color blindness. That's actually very rare uh, for a woman to have color blindness. Um, they're an older individual, a retiree, who has a broken wrist from a recent skiing expedition or a skiing trip. They're a non-native English speaker who does most of their work while on the go on an airplane. So they have a small device in a very distracting environment. Putting these simple lines in at the beginning of our project means designers have to think differently 
and, and build something that works for these people, and everyone without these limitations. Our developers have to come up with solutions that work for them. Our content editors have to come up with content that catches their eye quickly and helps guide them and tell our story. So, what happened? My presentation got way messed up. Where'd all my slides go? Huh? <laughs> all right. Technical difficulties. I apologize. Kevin's gonna kill me. All right. Let me just skip to where we were. Da, 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 da. I just put up the online version of this, which is all annotated. So lucky you get to see all the annotations. It's still messed up. Ugh. All right. All right. No problem. Thank you very much. Ugh. All right. That's where that looks better there, huh? Maybe I just won't go full screen. All right. So if we believe that every user deserves equal access, we throw out this idea that we know exactly who our users are, and we have to understand that they have actual differences. Ugh. Sorry about this. Um, you know exactly what I did to screw it up. Can you all, oh, look, you can see my code. I built this in a JavaScript framework, so. Uh, it is not in Drupal. I know. <laughs> Bring on the public shaming. I, I deserve it. I know exactly what I did wrong, and I'm going to fix it just really quickly. The embarrassment is mine. All right. Grunt serve. I am not a front end developer. Um, okay, let's try this one more time. All right, we'll leave it this big because I can't see. All right. Still missing slides, but whatever. Every user deserves equal access. <laughs> Number two. Apologize for this. So if we believe that every user deserves equal access, we have to throw the, out the idea that we can assume the connections our users have that we can assume what devices our users have. We can assume how they interact with our applications. We have to get rid of those assumptions and understand that today, in the world today, people interact with our digital products many different ways, across many different devices, locations, and um, connections. So a very interesting statistic. As of 2016, only 45% of internet browsing is from a desktop. That means 55% is from mobile, or devices we don't know. It could be a tablet, it could be a smart fridge, I don't know, it could be a screen reader. That's a majority of our users. So we can't assume that we know you're gonna to come to our website with this retina display. We can't make those assumptions, we can't build for that. We have to build for these differences. Now we can do this by building our content in a way that makes sense. So from our front end, we can structure our markup using semantic markup. This is the idea of using elements for the purposes of what they're supposed to be used for. You don't use an H3 tag to style, uh, just highlight text. You use it because it's a header. Now, there's this small TV agency in the UK called the BBC. And luckily, they open sourced all their semantic markup guidelines. And they talk about exactly how to use almost every single HTML element out there and why. And they follow that guideline. Open source, we can follow it too. It means that regardless of the device, if it renders HTML, it's going to use those tags for the purpose if they're meant for, and we know that. So if someone's on a screen reader, they're going to read headers as headers. If someone is on a mobile device, it's going to read header tags as header tags, or lists as lists. Use our semantic markup to use the elements the way they're meant to be used. We can use progressive design to deliver our experiences. Now, we have to understand that the purpose of design on our projects is to highlight what's important to the user. So scale back all the design we have and see 
do our users know what's important on this page? And then use design to progressively highlight what's important to them. And as we can learn about our users and their connections and the speed they have, add more elements to, to make it more flashy or design heavy. But if we scale back all the design, can the user still figure out what's important that we're trying to message them? And then prioritize what needs to be loaded. If our web page has to wait for that third-party JavaScript library to load to be usable, is that a priority for us? Do we really want them to have to wait for that if they're on a slow like 3G connection? Is that important? No, what's important is what the content is on our page. This is something like what Big Pipe is kind of good for. Not that it, it does this somewhat, but you know, it delivers the static content to the page, but on the background, anything that's not cached gets prefetched and, and added in. That's a great Drupal addition. Google is, I mean, dudes in this version is totally going to kill my jokes. Google is our, for lack of a better term, deafest, dumbest, blindest user. They don't care about the design. They don't care about our JavaScript libraries to some degree. What they care about is that the content is delivered in a way that it can understand, it can um, navigate through, and it can present to its users as accurately as possible. So if your clients, whether those are your, your bosses or clients paying for work, if they don't care about building things accessibly, they most likely care about the SEO value. And, and building these things and, and thinking the structure in this way aids in that and makes your products more discoverable. So another key and in, in, uh, interesting statistic is the average global internet speed is 6.3, that's megabits per second. Yeah, all right, always get it wrong. It's megabits per second uh, as of 2016. To put that into some sort of idea for you, the slowest is in the Republic of Mali at 0.5, and the fastest is in South Korea at 26.3. So this means if you're in the Republic of Mali, it takes Amazon.com over six seconds to load on, on your screen. That's a long time. I don't know what you're going to order on Amazon for Republic of Mali, but it doesn't matter. That's a long, long time. So if you're building for South Korea and you're assuming that's your user base and great, the website looks great for them because they have this big connection speed, you're loading all this cool data, anyone who has a slower speed has a bad experience. Instead, if you're building for the Republic of Mali, everyone who has that speed and greater has a progressively um, enhanced experience. Now, I'm not saying you have to build all your products to be these two extremes, but going back to pillar one, learning about your users, figuring out the, you know, the differences they have in planning for the quote unquote slowest connection or worst case scenario. I'll let you know that in the US, our average connection speed in the US is like 16.3. We're not even the top 10 of fastest countries. So we're already lucky that we're building for bad internet connections. Um, but so take that into consideration. I mean, more than half, oh, I don't know the number now, but like half the US is still on DSL dial-up connections. That's nuts. What would their experience be on your product uh, if you're not taking them into consideration? Things we can do to test for this and work on this is to artificially limit ourselves. As developers, we have accesses we have the access to tools to help us do this. Modern browsers, Chrome and Firefox, have built-in developer tools that allow you to artificially throttle your connection. You can say, show me this like I'm navigating it from a 3G connection, or that I'm on DSL dial-up. How long does it take to load? Let me see the experience there. You know, show me what my screen looks like if it's on a mobile device or a differently sized device. Can I see what's important there? We can disable our JavaScript. Um, people disable JavaScript for a number of reasons. Security concerns, uh, maybe they're on devices that don't support it. That's becoming a little more rare now, but people on screen readers, for example, don't have JavaScript. People on slow connections, the JavaScript's going to take a while to load. Is our website or application usable without it? That's, that'll be hard, I guess, with like a React app, but test to see if we can get our most important content available to them. And finally, can you navigate without a mouse? Let's think about back to our persona of the retiree who has a lot of money, just got back from a skiing accident or a skiing trip where they broke their wrist. Can they navigate to our donation page for our nonprofit? They can't use their mouse. Can they still get there? You know, that work, if it works for them, it's going to work for someone who doesn't have a mouse or, or has mobility issues and they can't use their hands to navigate. They navigate the web a different way. 
pillar number three to provide understandable content to every user. All right, I'm like all screwed up in my timing. If we believe in providing understandable content to every user, everyone here has to finally admit a fundamental truth about what we do. So we all here, if you're a developer, if you're a designer, if you're a UX uh, designer, if you're a content strategist, whatever, when you build something, you get really proud about it. And you should, right? We want to put our really cool algorithms, our really sweet designs and um, UX patterns up in digital museums and show them off and be like, look what I did, look how clever I was. Our users don't care about any of that. All our users care about is the content. They use our products to get information. So we want to make sure the information we provide them is as understandable as possible to all our users or potential users. I apologize for how small that is. But the city of Boston in 2016 rebuilt their website. I'm happy to say Genuine played a big part in the architecture of this and the development. It was in Drupal 7. It was, we started it before Drupal 8 was really ready to go. Um, but the old website, it, it was like built for the city employees. They defined the content structure. They defined what was written in the content. It was very jargony. If you wanted to find out about the street cleaning, you had to know what department handled that, what sub-department handled that, how to navigate through nested menus and pages and some pages to find it. That didn't help anybody. So when they were working on their redesign, they reached out and they learned about their actual users, their citizens. They found what information they needed, what they understood, and they, they rewrote all their content and restructured their website in a, in a way that made sense for them. One of the, one of the um, quotes I love from this project was from the Chief Information Architecture in an interview with the Boston Globe, where they said, the website should act like a helpful human. This is one of the big differences between the old site and the new site. On the old site, it would feel like you were interacting with some sort of lawyer robot that was speaking to you in government speak. I love that phrase, lawyer robot, government speak. There's very seldom cases when we want our content to be perceived that way. We want our content to seem like it's written for humans, by humans, because that's what it's for most of the time. So there's situations where you're writing content for computers. So when we're coming up with our content, we're helping our clients draft their content, we need to think about how we can as clearly and directly tell users about our message and, and what's important to them and what we want to share with them. We want to avoid Jargon and use simple phrasing. Don't use 300 words when you can use three words. What is the simplest way to say something that will deliver the most impact? Pay attention to font, spacing, and line length. So someone who may have a dyslexic disability, if they're reading serif fonts, the lines look like they, they run together. It's hard to understand the words. So use a sans serif font with a, a, a letter spacing that, that is clear and a word spacing that is clear. And then line length. Line length is a hard one, but does everybody here know, have you, have you ever heard of the F pattern? No, all right, so this is how people read content on the web. We read the first line, we read the second line, we read half of the third line, half of the fourth line, a quarter of the fifth line, we start to scan. It's an F pattern. The more content and content heavy copy you have, the, more, the higher chance that someone's going to miss the important thing that you want to tell them. So again, it's about as little as we have to put on the page to tell them what's important. Now there's going to be cases you know, like scientific journals where you have jargon and you have a lot of heady content. Those come where they may, but for majority of people, just what do we have to say and how can we easily say it? We can use tools to make sure the content we're writing full is meaningful. So it's written for humans by humans and has a readability score that um, makes it useful for as many people. Have, has anyone here heard about readability scores? So readability is not about someone's education level or their vocabulary. It's about the mental energy it takes to understand what's written on the page. Because processing content you're reading is a physical process. It takes energy. And throughout the day, we all only have so much energy to spend. There's great tools online, like HemingwayApp.com is what I like to use. Uh, there's tons of out there and plugins. And it, you paste your content in, 
And it tells you, hey, this has a reading level of grade 12, which means it's going to take a lot of mental energy for someone to understand what you writ have written. It highlights really long sentences that are like run on or that are heavy verbiage. It tells you where you may be able to use simpler phrasing. This is not the end all be all. This is also not the only tool out there. But it provides you just some insights on am I writing content in a way that is simple and drives the point, or am I just being overly verbose? I use this for everything. My twi tweets, to my emails to clients, to my session proposals, which, like, I mean, I got here, right? So <laughs> it, it's, it, they're good things to check. We have to remember that our content, another purpose of it is to inform and guide our users. It's not just the information we're providing to them, but it's how we're telling them to use our products. So when we have error messages, we want to be thoughtful with what those messages say. We don't want to scare users away when they forget to fill out a form or, or they miss something or the website goes down. We want to be like, hey, oops, there was a mistake. Don't worry about it. Everything's cool. Here's what you need to do to fix it. We want to plan a user's journey. Think about what steps does a user have to take to get to, say, that donation page, get to that cart checkout page, get to that mission statement page and how they get there from the home page or from a search result, and what content you need to write to help guide them on this choose your own adventure that you're providing for them. And then provide contextual relations to content. Just not, let's not just assume that we can build a view that uses uh, vocab um, taxonomy tags to then serve up related content. Like, you might like this, you might like this. That works, but again, humans, can build relations to things that machines just can't do right now. An example of this is on the city of Boston's website again. On their homepage, they have these five buckets of like, here's what you want to know the most of. These five things, out of the box, if you read them, you can't read them here, I apologize. They have nothing to do with each other, really. So there's street cleaning, there is uh, building permits, there's uh, trash pickup, there's parking meters, and there's tow lots. They may be different departments, different areas of the city, different whatever. But to humans, if, if you don't know the street cleaning schedule or you don't know the rules for parking meters, you want to know where the tow lots are. I tell you from experience, you want to know where the tow lots are. They have contextual links that humans put together. So you, you want to try to think through that when you're building pages and relating content. Giving uh, content editors a way to just pull in whatever, not whatever, but content that they think is human relevance. I don't like the way I said that, but anyways. Number four, to provide every user with trust and respect. I think this is one of the most, most important pillars. If we believe in providing our users trust and respect, just like we have to understand that our content is the most important thing to the user, we have to recognize that the most precious thing that the user has is their information. And if we want that, we have to convince them that we're going to treat it fairly, that we're going to be respectful with it, and that we deserve to have that information. I first learned about inclusive design with this amazing talk titled Inclusive Design Excluding No Gender by Sarah Learen. She's a UX developer out of Sweden, I believe. And in her talk, she basically sums up inclusive design by saying the simplest way to do inclusive design is to stop asking about gender. Now what this highlights is Sarah talks about when she meets with a client and she's looking at the forms on their page and they have like, oh, what's your gender? Male or female? She stops her client and says, why do you collect this information? 99% of the time the client's like, I don't know, we just always collected it. She's like, stop. You're not using it. You're assuming how someone's going to answer. That's a barrier to potential users. That's a barrier to providing information to people. Get rid of that gender field you're going to see uh, a, a bigger increase in people submitting their information and, and, and providing you the info you want to reach more people. Drupal.org has a gender field. It's non-binary. It has multiple options. Um, there's debate going on right now about if it has enough options, but um, regardless of that, they give you the option not to answer, to, to tell them how you identify. What they don't do a great job of is telling you why they collect this information. Um, I know it's for, so the Drupal Association can figure out the diversity of our community. Uh, but they could do better there. But 
at least they give you an option, which is great. It's a great start if you have to ask for gender. So this goes back to the idea of when we need to collect information or our clients want to collect information, collecting only the info we need. Asking ourselves, why do we need this data? Just like Sarah asked her clients about the gender question. Do we need it? Does it serve a purpose? Are we doing anything to use this data to improve and provide a positive experience to other people? If not, why do we need to collect it? What options can we give to our users when we do collect data? Again, going back to the gender question, question as a really good example, do we have to say, choose male or female? Can we make an open text field where they can tell us how they identify and we can get more accurate information about our users to use that going back to pillar one to improve for our actual users. And most importantly, why should users give this to us? What reason are we telling users it's a good idea to give us your information? We need a reason, we need to convince the users, and we have to be truthful about why. A website that does a great job of this is Pinterest. And yes, I have a Pinterest account because of this presentation. Um, I can show you some really good woodworking pins. Um, they ask for a gender when you sign up, and they have initially male and female. It's not a required field, and they have this tooltip next to it that says, hey, we collect your gender so we can better show you suggestions. And you know what? If you don't identify as one of these two genders, here's a text field. Tell us. We want to know how you identify so we can start um, making better predictions for people that recognize the same way you recognize yourself. It's a, it's a great way to handle the gender question, um, and they're telling us why they use this data. They're giving us the option to control it. And we have to be responsible with our data when we do collect it. This is the most important part of this pillar, and there's legal reasons why. One, we have to explain how data is used. There's you know, the EU cookie policy, which eventually I'm sure the US will get there and will have one. Uh, but we have to tell users when we collect information on them, and what we're going to do with it. Why don't we just do that anyways? Make people feel comfortable that they know their information is not going to be used for insidious purposes. Explain how we protect the data. And now with rules such as GDPR, which is the Global Data Protection uh, uh, Regulation, which is coming out of Europe. Has everyone here heard of GDPR? No. no. Okay. You want to start looking into this if you have any website that collects information from a user that could be based outside of the US, based in the UK, because what GDPR says is one, how you have to protect a user's data, like you really have to protect it, and you have to give them control to say, show me every all the information you have about me, let me edit any information you have about me, let me remove any information you have about me. Now, for, for, for some legacy clients, that's going to be a hard sell, but the, the cost of doing it is way outweighs the price that they'll pay if they get fined, which is 4% of your global profit or like $24 million, whichever one is, whichever one is lower, no, higher. That's nuts. That's a lot of money for not giving users access to their data. Doing so builds trust to our users by saying, Here's all the info I have about you. Here's your profile. Edit the fields so that you can tell me exactly who you are. Makes users feel like, oh, all right, I could control this information because it is their information to control. We're just asking to see it. And we get better results on knowing our users, and we can reevaluate our products to build them more to meet them. So despite the technical difficulties, those are my four pillars. Every user deserves, uh, no user is average. Every user deserves equal access to provide understandable content for every user, and every user deserves our trust and respect. If we can do these four things, or one of these four things, we can build products that make a positive impact on as many people as possible. So how many people here think they could start doing one of these things in their projects? Almost all the hands, all right. I convinced some of you. Um, thank you for raising your hands and saying that. So that's all I have with this version of this deck. Um, yes, I said that. I do have resources, though. I have this presentation available online, um, and there should be a tweet about it going out shortly with a link to it that now I have to fix since I have so much problems with it. 
Uh, I have these slides on SlideShare available, annotated, so you can review them. Uh, a link to the 10 Principles of Inclusive Design by um, Sandy Wasserman. I have the link to Todd Rose's talk on the myth of average. Again, I really recommend watching that talk. It's really eye-opening. Uh, a link to the BBC Semantic Guidelines for using semantic markup. And finally, Sarah Lahren's talk on inclusive design, excluding our gender. Now, so I can collect information about my users on this presentation, and I don't have to assume the audience. I'd love feedback and questions. Um, you, can, you can tell me now, you can tell me later. I, Happy to talk later about inclusive design or anything, web development or woodworking or whatever. Uh, so again, you can find me online at MikeMiles86. And one more plug for my podcast is the next episode, which comes out on the 13th, so a week from Tuesday. Uh, we're actually talking about the importance of different perspectives and accessibility and diversity. I talked with um, uh, Carrie Fisher from Book 42 on it, so give it a listen when it comes out. And with that, uh, I'll take any questions after uh, pity applause for the technical issues. <laughs> any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so I find something that's really, really important for uh, ensuring an inclusive or accessible site is applying rigorous standards to so all the content that gets pushed out. And that need always seems to sort of contrast with the desires of content creators who want more and more power to do more and more things. They want a busy way. They want to be able to rearrange blocks. Um, they want to meet some very specific esoteric design and visual goal that I know can never be uh, accessible. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that dissonance, that, that pressure to break your standards? So the question was, if I can rephrase it, was how do you break the like the stigma or the pre-existing standards that your your company may have or your client may have about the freedom to give editors to do whatever they want versus setting up something that's more accessible or more inclusive? Sure. I think it's um, it's a balancing act about educating um, and using metrics to find out who are we actually trying to reach. What do they understand? Let's let's do user um, interviews and using that data to inform how to build something following a, a, a more approved process, a governance process. You can still give them those tools like a WYSIWYG. You can give them the ability to move blocks around or you know, use panels. Um, but making sure that they're conscious that they're not doing it just for what looks good for me, it's what looks good for everybody. So the only way to do that is through education. And, and it's not about making a drastic change all at once. It's like making a little improvement each time. So even when you're building from the Drupal perspective, think about what limitations am I putting on my content editors, or where do I have to limit them? Let me talk to stakeholders and figure that out. So just, I say the way to go through it is an evolution process of one step at a time. That's the best I can say. I can also give you the scary answer to that too, uh, which, which is more in terms of accessibility, but you can always tell people, like if you're, I guess this isn't your question at all, but if, if clients say, we don't want to build for inclusive design, we don't want to build for accessibility, you ask them, do you want to hire lawyers? Because lawyers cost more than developers. And the story comes from like Winn-Dixie and Target, where Target in 2009 was sued by the uh, American Association for the Blind, I think it was, because none of their images had alt text. And they're like, nah, we're not going to do that, whatever. They got taken to court, they lost. And they had to not only pay the court fees, and not even had to do a court battle, but then they had to pay to have the alt all images have alt text and be required. So it's like, do you want to pay for that or you want us just to pay us a little bit extra to add this feature onto it? So developers are cheaper than lawyers. Yes? This is your mic when you were talking about kind of the attention span as someone goes mic one mic to yep. the F method? Uh, it's an, known as an F pattern. Because you read the whole line, then like half a line, and half a line. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so for Subjects or pages requiring a little more historical context where the, the matter is going to be made by force be a little you know, more dense. Yep. And you want to link and get people to kind of drill down to understand what would the recommendation be there? So I would say for, for situations where you need 
content heavy pages, say like for publications or uh, for other needs, obviously you're going to go with that um, for more traditional. Say like, you know, we're not going to tell the New York Times website to be like, do very little text on your articles. Like, you're not going to say that. I think you have to take it case by case and like things on say, like the About Us page. Do you need huge amount of copy? Can you streamline what you're writing? I think it's about just figuring well, out. Maybe blocks on the side. I'm noticing in the city of Boston say yeah. contact info, email, I mean almost extracting that. Yeah, they extract it. I think it's part of your design, like spa clear spacing, clear identification of like breaking content up into sections instead of just like one big long runoff. Yeah. yeah. Just like break it up. Think about if you're reading it, you're going to start to glaze over. And so like, how can you break it up? Make it a little more engaging um, into the subsections. So people can skim to the parts they want to know about and then read those sections. I'm, I'm no expert. Anchors, I guess, too. Yeah, anchors, copies. yeah. Summary at the beginning. I'm not an expert in content, yeah. but um, I just try to think, like, what would I want to see? Where do I start glazing over and not paying attention? So that's, that's a great question. Anything else? Yeah. Right, great. I, I think I'm a little early. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Thank you for staying with me, and I thought everyone was going to leave the room when the lights turned on. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, I'll be around the rest of the camp. Uh, if you want to applaud again, you can. <laughs>